Hello, it's been a few weeks, hasn't it? Um, still not changed, still presenting from uh, home. But uh, what doesn't change either is that we get some great guests uh, on this show. And uh, as we build up to a, a new football season, and let's hope we can get fans back in as well, by the way, pretty early on in it, uh, we'll be looking ahead to the prospects for both Sheffield United and Sheffield Wednesday. It's high time, as I've said on Twitter, that we had a particular former Blade striker on the show. I mean, his deeds in one particular Sheffield derby are quite legendary in this city. Well, half of the city uh, anyway. Uh, a fine striker in his day for several clubs, not just Sheffield United. He still lives in the city. He is Carl Asaba. Hello, Carl. How are you? Hey, Alan. Thanks. That's very, very complimentary. It started really well. I think we should end it now. It's going to be downhill from here on. Um, oh, it's all, it's all, all downhill from now, mate. All downhill so. from now. And, of course, we, we live in the similar area of the city. So I, I see, you, see you out and about uh, quite, a, quite a bit. It's always, always good to see you. And uh, also, also with us, somewhat more distant, and I can't work this one out. As I've said on Twitter, I can't work out whether he's the Sheffield Stars man in South Africa or South Africa's man in Sheffield. Uh, he is Joe Cran, Sheffield Wednesday writer. Um, whereabouts are you now, Joe? Tell us. I'm, uh, I'm still in Johannesburg. I was in Cape Town for a week um, saying goodbye to some friends because I finally got a flight now. So I was in Cape Town last week, said, said goodbye to some people, and now I've got uh, like 10 more days in Joburg, and then finally I should be on a very expensive flight back to, uh, to England. You've been waiting a long, long time. I'm sure yeah, when, they four months. You, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> when they employed you, uh, had they made you the job offer, had they known it was going to be so long, I'm not sure they'd have made it, would they? Yeah, keep that quiet, because I don't want them changing their mind. <laughs> <laughs> Sheffield Wednesday fan, now Sheffield Wednesday writer. Lots to look forward to there. Carl, um, when we last met on the, on the street, when I was walking down to the shops in the village and I said to you, oh, blimey, I mean, I forgot my mask. I mean, there's something that we, none of us thought we'd ever, ever be saying in our lifetime. And I had to beat a hasty retreat. You mentioned that you were kind of looking to get into our business. I'm frightened to death, mate. Oh, well, no, you know, I stutter and I don't see things very well, so I don't think I'll be taking anyone's place yet. But, yeah, I'm looking to, to get into the, the media side of football. I've shied away since I've retired. Um, but I'm, I really want to get involved. I'd like to do some match analysis, you know, and just pop up at halftime and give the odds, you know, the odd report of what's happening. So I, I'm looking to get into all this now. Okay, then you've made a start. You're on a course, are you not, of some sort? Uh, well, the PFA are going to put me towards um, a journalism course at uh, Staff Stafford University, um, which is a part-time course, goes on for two years, but just to get the brain thinking and be more coherent. Yeah, well, I mean, you were a good talker in your day. I did uh, several interviews with you, and I also, also always thought you were quite pretty honest because... You didn't just face up when things were good. Uh, we're going to talk about a particular derby in which you were the star man in 2001, a little bit later. But there was a subsequent one where you were the villain of the piece, weren't you? Yeah, but that, that fell on my, it was my little brother's, I think it was his 18th birthday. And we, we had, uh, obviously he was an apprentice at Sheffield while, while I was there. And after the match, we'd, all the family were up and we, we booked a big restaurant and we were going to celebrate his birthday. On the way back on the coach, everyone, party's off. Daniel, miss your birthday. No celebrations here because I think we drew. We drew, but I, I missed some chances and it was a horrible match. And it means so much. You know, you, you don't play in the derby and, and the results are relevant. You win and you celebrate. If you don't, that's it. You, you know. Was that, a nil, was that a nil-nil or a one-one? That was, that was a Hillsborough as well, wasn't it? Yeah, but there was, we had so many chances. I, I had a lot of chances and we just kept spurning them. I think it was myself and Ify and Nora were up front and it, it was one of those days where it just was not going to go in. So, yeah, I have bad memories. And my, my little brother still, still brings it. It was his birthday yesterday and he brought it up. Do you remember when you cancelled my party? So, um, yeah. <laughs> It's good and bad memories at Hillsborough. Well, I'll tell you what, what I appreciated at that time was um, that I 
interviewed you at the day after that game and you bravely faced up to a bit of a, a grilling, as much as any conversation with me can be a grilling, <laughs> about all those missed chances. And, you know, we appreciate that more than the interviews that players give in the good times, don't we, Joe? You know, when players face up like that, when you know it's going to be difficult and painful for them, you know, that that's, says something about their character. Yeah, definitely. I, I think it's one of I think you often get the um, the real the real side of, of of not just football as people in general when you get them at a, a time after that. I think it is um, quite regular for for people in in positions of, of of notoriety to to shy away when when times are tough. I think one of the ones that stuck out for me recently was the the David Luiz one after after the Arsenal game when he got sent off and he came out and he was like, "Look, this one's on me. You know, I, I take full responsibility for the result." And, and I think that takes a, for want of a better term, it takes a lot of bollocks to, to come out like that. And especially after a, after a derby to, to come out and, and face the press. Um, like you say, Alan, you're, you're, you're not so bad, you know. <laughs> I'm, sure, <laughs> I'm sure there are people out there who might have been a little bit angrier, but it's still, you know, it, for me, it, I, I really like talking to, to people when they're prepared to be honest with you, you know, regardless of the situation that they find themselves in. I, I yeah. found it embarrassing um, more if, if, if you're interviewed when you've scored or you've, the, you've got the winning goal, you're, you're only getting the headlines, whereas the team, it's a team effort. So I find, found it easier to, to have an interview after a match when my personal performance wasn't good instead of getting all the plaudits at the end of a match where, you know, I could have tapped it in from one yard but been terrible for 89 minutes. But yet... I'm being sought, sought to, to give all the, get all the acclaim and to be the star when deep down inside, you know, well, there's, there's 10 other players who work their socks off who aren't being interviewed. And I found those celebratory interviews a lot harder to do than if, like the one Alan's talking about, when I, I did do badly, where I was given the chances and I didn't perform, they're easy interviews because you can be honest and, and the fans appreciate it because... Fans want to win. And if you're not willing to talk to them when you've let their team down, then you don't really deserve to be at the team. So, no, I found that interview much easier to do, to do it, Alan. <laughs> right. Well, I wish I'd have known that. I'd have interviewed more time, <laughs> you more times when you missed chances. <laughs> it was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a great, it's a great viewpoint. Uh, we're going to talk about 2001. Uh, I mean, you'll struggle with this a little bit later. You will struggle with it because it's all good. It's all good uh, later on. But I think we ought to to really update ourselves now. And, uh, you know, I know that Joe's on the Sheffield Wednesday beat. Might not be uh, still in uh, Sheffield. Might still be in South Africa. But the way, the way things are these days, Joe, you can see as much, if not more, from there um, via all the technology yeah. than you can from the city. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, uh, everything's available nowadays. It's wicked. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, they might even keep you there. You never know. Now that you've got to fly back, they might say, well, I'll tell you what, you're doing such a great job from Johannesburg. We'll, we'll, we'll keep you over there. That's, that's where I'll put my foot down. It, I need to get myself back to Willsbury. It's kind of why I took the job, you know. <laughs> it's yeah. uh, being back home and, and being able to, you know, some, someone paying me to follow Sheffield Wednesday around is, is I mean, it's, it's a dream for me. So, um, as... as as nice as it's been that I've been able to do the job from here, you know, because of the circumstances that the world find it, finds itself in, it's not really been that detrimental because, you know, I, I would, we weren't doing press conferences, we weren't doing any of that stuff. So I haven't missed out in that sense. But um, my, my plan was always, you know, even though this has is, is, is been feasible, not ideal, but the, the plan was always to get back for the new season. And, and that's why I've... I've taken the route that I have. I've, I've emptied out some of my savings to get a, a, like I say, a very expensive repatriation flight. But it, it's just uh, the time has come now. I needed to get home. OK, well, the, you're going to be home in time for the new season, all being well or roughly around the time of the new season. That, 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 that's great. And you've been covering signings and you, you had some news uh, only this week about uh, a trialist that, that Sheffield Wednesday might be looking looking to pursue. But what do you make of it? Fazayo Adeli Bashiru from Manchester City, uh, a permanent signing. Uh, Izzy Brown, um, Carl might have a view on him, from, from Chelsea. Very impressive loan for the season. Shea Dunkley from, from Wigan. 
uh, and possibly, quite likely, Josh Windass to follow. What, what, where, what's your assessment, um, first of all, Joe, on that? I think it's, for me, it's, it's very, um, you've got to be careful to, to judge signings, you know, prior to a match they haven't played and, and prior to the window being closed as well, because I think there's still a lot more that Wednesday are looking to get done. Um, I know they're keeping, uh, I mean, you did a piece on it the other week, pe keeping things very quiet because it's a very sort of volatile, delicate market and you don't want to get pipped to the post by people hearing your business and all that kind of thing. Um, but I, I'm quite excited, you know. I'm, I'm quite excited now about the, the season ahead. I obviously watched them against Leicester and they, they look solid, they look compact. Um, you know, I think Izzy Brown could be a, could be a quality signing for us. Um, I've got a lot of friends who are Chelsea fans who've, who've been raving about his, his potential for years. I know he's, you know, he's not a kid anymore. So he's, he's at that age where he's got a point to prove. And he's a, I think the big thing with, with Izzy is that he's going to take some of, the, some of the responsibility away from, from Barry Bannon. I think, you know, Baz has been the creative hub of Sheffield Wednesday for years now. And it kind of, it seems to have gotten to a point when if a team can stop Barry, then you stop Wednesday. And with with Izzy there now, that is uh, is hopefully something that will that will change, and and with Fisayo, Fisayo is he's exciting, you know, like he's he's exactly the sort of player that that um, that Gary's been talking about. He he's looking for these young, hungry, dynamic players, and and obviously Fizz comes from a, a Manchester, Manchester City background. He's been there I think since he was eight years old, so he's he's got lots of uh, sort of lots of potential there you know you don't stay at a club like Man City for that length of time if you haven't um, and against against Leicester he, he came on he, he did well so um, obviously with Shea we're, we're still waiting but from what I've seen and heard of him um, he is exactly the kind of personality that Wednesday have been looking for um, now we just need to try and get some strikers in <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. It's very, well, it's Carlos Sarva. He's available. He, he's 47 now, but he's, he's, he's available. I'm, I'm right there, Carl. Uh, yeah, what do you there's a very interesting signing that Sheffield Wednesday have made that you haven't mentioned. For me, it's going to be key. And that's ex play James Beating, you know, um, yeah, to help definitely. the strikers. And more importantly, if you remember when Gary Monk was really doing well at Swansea, Beats was there beside him and they worked well together. And I think he will take a lot of pressure off um, Gary and he's very, very trusted. You know, Gary believes a lot in him and, and Beats has been there. He's done it. He's, ex he's exceptional. But he'll be able to actually get on the training field. He's still young enough. He's mobile and it won't be just talking to them. He'll be displaying it and he'll be very physical. And I think he'll give all the strikers, the, the, you know, the academy ones, but the, the actual ones who are there, the first, a big boost because he's a big character and you want to impress him because he's going to embarrass you on the training field if you don't. Well, so, you, well you said about getting him in the, in the training field. We might need him on the field. Yeah, maybe we can get him in as a coach because uh, as it stands, we've got Jordan Rhodes and that's it. So James might have to get his boots back on. But they're very similar mild players. You know, Jordan's a battering ram who can do a lot of finesse play, whereas Beats was identical. And I think that, you know, it could give him another lease of life because I don't think we've seen the best of Rhodes. Um, and as I say, Beats, and Beats will draw strikers there as well now because if you're in the, the under-23s or the reserve team at a Premier League club, you're not just going to be going to play games and you can lose your way after five or six matches. You're actually going to be developing still on the training field where a lot of loan signings, when they come to lower teams, they're just, the emphasis is just on the play, on the match, the match, the match. But you've got James Beattie, who's, you know, he's played for England, he's been at Everton, he's, you're going to gain a lot on the training ground. So I think he'll be a draw to, to sign players also. Great points. Uh, and uh, you, you speak from knowledge of, of knowing uh, James Beattie as, as well, Carl. He's, he's a great, great lad. Um, he's a massive character in the dressing room, away from the, the ground. He's, he, he's a great professional. And he'll be able to see the young lads who may not be living the right lifestyle, who may just be missing a dietary or a sleep issue. You know, don't go out this night. Don't do that. And it might change someone's career because you don't play at that level for that level of time without being a great professional. You know, you can have, be a great footballer and last five years. 
but a great professional has a length of career that Beats has had. So I, I think he's, he's going to be a really good asset to them. And you could say some of those self-same things about Jordan Rhodes. You don't score as many goals and be at the top of your game for as long as he yes. has without being a, a, an excellent player. So there's real hope there. Be able to help him manage a few more years, you know, because James was able to eke out extra years and Jordan, Jordan might, you know, have a few quiet moments with James. It's, it's interesting for me. Yeah. Can I ask you about another striker across the city? Because... Um, Lise Mousse um, has clearly got a great deal of talent. Uh, I mean, you, Carl, for, for, from my memory of you, 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 you were very strong uh, as a front player. You, you had a good turn of speed uh, up there as well. You could score a goal. Now, this fella, uh, Lise Mousse, uh, is, is, is pacey, he, he's powerful, he's got lovely footwork. Everything seems to be there to be a success. Uh, slightly enigmatic. What do you, so far anyway, what do you make of him, uh, Carl, what you've seen? Well, um, me, me eldest son wishes I was him. He'd like to swap me for Musa. He loves him. Uh, and he is, he's a player who excites. It's going to be confidence and goals. You know, it's a simple, simple equation, confidence and goals. And he could just go on and on and on because his talent, his speed, he's got everything. It's going to be how they manage him if he doesn't if we go if we don't start as well as we did last year and we're not scoring as well and he goes off the boil how do you keep him going how do you get him back because when I was there with Warnock we we had a lot of um, foreign strikers who came in and if they went off the boil it you could lose them like Sufo he had everything he came from Barcelona and when he played he was incredible. But if he had a little run where it wasn't going well for him, he'd sort of disappear for a lot longer than the, the UK born player. I'm not, you know, I, it's just how you keep on top of Musa because he could be a player in, in the next window who, if he went for 40, 50 million, you wouldn't be surprised because of his attributes. It's just does who, who's going to be around him to get the best out of him all the time. That, that's what I, I'm, you know, I'm keen to see this season. Yeah, funnily enough, in my column this week, I, I actually said if he puts all the parts of his game together, he'd be worth 40 or 50 million. Really? You know, I haven't been stalking you writing, but that's just, you know, great minds. Great minds. <laughs> well, I, I hope so. It certainly is in, in your case. But a real challenge for Chris Wilder, who's, um, you know, a great man manager. Um, mm -hmm. I think he let a little bit of his frustration show towards the end of last season, possibly about uh, Moussa's fitness levels, I don't know, and the fact that he tailed off. Um, but there seems to be a recognition about what you're saying there, that this is where a, a manager's arts come into play, about the handling, mm -hmm. the way he's handled. Yeah, well, definitely, and and the partnerships. I'd be it'd be interested to go training and see what the partnerships are in the training games because that can also have a, a big effect on the player's psyche. Because I'd know if I was training a lot with a certain striker, I'd be you know the manager really fancies me to be in the the A partnership, and it's. How Musa, you know, if Musa's not in that A partnership, how how does he go? Will he still be there waiting to take his chance? Um, and that's I'd like to go, you know, and watch them train just to see what the key partnerships are. If, if Billy uh, and McBurney are the, are the the key pairing in training, it's it, that stuff fascinates me because that's how simple it can be to lose a player. Because if I train with uh, sorry, my dog snoring. Uh, if you can hear him in the back, he's got his snore on. Uh, you, we put him Carl, you put him to sleep. You put yeah, he was up, yeah. But it, it, it's one of the, if he's mentally strong enough to be in the second string or the first string and, and how he gets on. And that's a, a difference between a 40 and 50 million pound striker or someone who could just frizzle out. Mm. Well, we'll talk a bit later about what the partnerships could be. But, of course, Chris Wilder was on the trail of several more signings. I think five, he said. I think he's pretty confident of getting five in. So we'll address that in part two. Mm -hmm. Meantime, Joe, we can't really talk about Sheffield Wednesday, 
partnerships up front, can we? Because we're talking about one man at the moment. <laughs> yeah, Jordan Rhodes and, and Charles Agan, you know, 18-year-old who's just been promoted to the first team. It's, you know, it's, it's interesting what, what, what Carl said about, about James Beattie because I don't know if I'm being like overly optimistic and just the Wednesday out in me is, is sort of clouding my journalistic judgment, but I just, I would love to see James Beattie sort of get Jordan Rhodes to where Jordan Rhodes was before he came to Wednesday. You know, his, his record in the championship in the football league in general is ridiculous. And um, if James could get something out of him and we could see a Jordan Rhodes that gets 10, 15 goals this season, then, you know, that's a, that's a game changer for Wednesday. But, you know, you can't sort of throw all your hats onto that, that peg and hope that that's going to happen. And um, there's a, there's a lot that's, that's going to sort of transpire over the course of the next few weeks. I think, you know, obviously Josh Windass coming in is, is a plus for Wednesday if, if that gets finalised, which I think everyone's hoping will happen. But also with Josh, he's not really a striker, you know, he's, he's more of a, you know, I know he played there a couple of times, but for me, he's more of an attacking midfielder than a, than a striker sort of out and out. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's going to be really, it's going to be really key now for Wednesday in, in terms of who they're able to bring in up front, because if they're going to keep with this three five two, you know, it, I think there's a, there's a possibility of playing Izzy Brown as a as a ten, you know, just behind, just behind Jordan. But you can't you can't like I say you can't throw everything into into Jordan Rhodes turning things around because you know three goals last season all in one game is is not gonna is not gonna keep you in the league when you've got a, a twelve point deduction. So we've now got to wait and see what happens. But um, Obviously, first game against Warsaw in just a few days' time, and then first game of the season in ten days' time. And I think Wednesday fans are are sweating a little bit. We're, we're hoping to talk to to Gary this week before the Warsaw game. So hopefully, when that is uh, when that press conference is is done, we'll have a little bit more clarity on on where things stand. Yeah, interesting. So just before we go to the break um, in this part, there seems to be a, an air of optimism around Sheffield Wednesday that's quite rare for a club that still needs four or five more signings that will start with minus 12 points next season. It uh, doesn't seem logical that there should be so much enthusiasm around the place. What do you put that down to, uh, Joe? I mean, look, football is illogical in general, I think. Um, I think you know, I, I have this kind of buoyancy before every season. It doesn't really matter what, what's happened. You know, you get to this point when it just starts to pick up a little bit. But in Wednesday's case, I think there's been a lot. I think, as Carl mentioned earlier, a, a big signing for Wednesday is, is the, the, the technical staff. And I don't just mean James. You know, obviously, they've, they've brought in a new goalkeeper coach, a new first-team coach. And I think that that, that has definitely given a, a boost because obviously everyone knows that they're people that, that Gary's wanted involved in the club for uh, ever since he came in, really. So that's been a boost. Obviously, a couple of new signings, some good personalities they've brought in. Um, and I think just little things like Wednesday have really, I'm sure you've noticed, Wednesday have really up their sort of outgoings in terms of social media. Like the, the, they're giving a bit more of an insight into the club. And I, the, the players, because of that, the players seem a, a bit more human. You know, they're not just a couple of guys you watch run around on a field and then you never hear or see from them again. All of a sudden now we've, because of the, the, the way that Wednesday have been, have been doing it, which is, which is great, you know, I've, I've really enjoyed the, the content they're creating. Um, it gives a bit more of a connection there. And, you know, it's something that Gary mentioned. He, he spoke about wanting to, to, to bring back this connection to the fans. And, and I think that is, has played a big role in, in this growing optimism I mean, well, look it could all fall out of its arse if we don't get a result against Warsaw you know if it's a bad result in the first game of the league season it, it can disappear very quickly but um, I think that the the sort of the way that the club's been recruiting you know if you look at recent recruitments you, you look at Iorfa and, and Luongo and, and, and people that they've brought in for you know next to nothing obviously Kadeem Harris came in as a, as a free as well um, and then had the, the new guys this season and it's, it's recruitment in a way that I think a lot of fans wanted to see recruitment go. You know, they're, they're now looking um, to be spending a little bit more smartly and, and, and making a, a few more, um, using a bit more nows when they're, when they're signing players. And that's exactly what fans have been looking for. Um, yeah. Like I say, this could all disappear very, very quickly. But um, I am definitely very much on the, on the positivity bandwagon and, and all the interactions between the players has, has been really positive as well. 
Excellent. Yeah, I agree with all of that, uh, Joe. Much more where this came from in part two with Joe Cran of the Sheffield Star and with uh, former blade striker Carl Asaba. We will let him relive the Hillsborough Derby of 2001 in part two in what is a show uh, of uh, a traditional taste and flavour. Uh, for instance, yeah, traditional taste and flavour. I'm talking to a lot of people who don't know what the hell I'm talking about. But uh, to those who like a, a good beer... In, uh, and I, he's one of them, uh, Carl, <laughs> they will know. And it's about that as well. Rejoin us in part two.